solely on VR experience. And this is the man who's helping me him out with that vision. And who also stole my computer once, but I'm not mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what he's referencing. <laughs> um, okay, hi, how's everybody doing? Tired after a long day or you good? Yeah. yeah? All right, cool. So I'm Daniel Hagstrom. I studied game design and programming here 2009 to 2012. And right now I'm at Resolution Games uh, in Stockholm. I've been there for about nine months. Uh, and uh, before that I worked in Uppsala for about a year and a half. And before that in Copenhagen for something like two years. Um, and my talk here today is split in two parts. First, I'll talk a bit about VR, um, which is what I work with today, uh, and a few learnings about we've had during the produ products we've developed and uh, you know the, what I've been a part of in those productions and stuff like that. The second part is more about what I've learned in general when it comes to working in the game dev industry, um, some pitfalls I've stepped into uh, or just about avoided uh, and some things I've noticed after my four years of earning my salary by making games. Um, it's also a bit more about feelings and, and softer values rather than truths. It's, it's definitely an opinion piece uh, and there's a spectrum here and I'm maybe on one end and there are people on the other so take it as you will. So first, here's where I work now. Um, I'm at a resolution, I have about 20 colleagues, uh, and together we make mobile VR games. Uh, it was founded January 2015 by previous King employees and, and some key people from there. And about a month ago, we released our third game, uh, Wonderglade. So I'll, I'll show a trailer of, of that to give you an idea of how it, what that is. But that seems to be one of the things that wasn't translated well into, does this work? Will this be a video? Uh, might contain viruses, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, sure, that's fine. <laughs> Not available. To the amazing, the incredible, Wait till you get to try it. Um, okay, so we launched on the 11th of November this year, which was the same date as the launch of the Daydream platform. So Google Daydream is a new headset and controller. It's unfortunately not for sale in Sweden yet, but it, in most larger countries it's being sold since about a month back. Uh, you know, United States, Germany, Australia. And it's a, it's a carnival themed theme park game where you get to play different mini games of varying types, like the ones you saw in the trailer. Um, and, you know, Wonderglade has done really well for us so far. Um, it's a new platform, but so far the views are very good. We are happy, and the people playing the game seem to be very happy. It was one of the few featured titles at launch, and we ended up sort of front and center. The first thing you saw when you open up the Google Play Store in VR. It's also for free, so that helps. Uh, but we're, we're very happy so far. Um, when I started at Resolution, I also helped out for the final touches on Bait, which is our fishing game uh, and also a very successful mobile VR title. 
it's a it's a nice calm fishing game for the Samsung Gear VR. Has anybody tried that? Has anybody tried any VR at all? Yes. Okay. Has anybody tried mobile VR? A few. Okay. But nobody tried bait so far. No, that's okay. So uh, we released that on the 23rd of March this year, uh, and it's been out for about nine months now. And three months ago, so six months after launch, we uh, announced that we had reached 750,000 downloads. And at that time, the official headset count on the market was 1.5 million, according to Samsung. So, which meant that we had hit 50% of the entire market at that time. Uh, so half of the people owning a Gear VR had tried our game, which is kind of weird to think about. Uh, and the review rating on the Samsung store, which is a different store from Google Play, is around four. So we're also very happy with that. Uh, this is also for free. So the focus for Bait was that we wanted to make an uh, accessible game, very comfortable, and we wanted it to be the sort of go-to game when introducing VR to a new person. Uh, and I think we succeeded in that. Uh, Oculus uses Bait when demoing Gear VR. Uh, at E3, I think was the last I heard about. Um, the Verge wrote, definitely the next game I'm getting my mom to try, which is kind of what we wanted it to be. So, so that's very, we're happy with that as well. Um, so VR development, and maybe mobile VR, is, is pretty similar to normal or sort of traditional game development in most aspects, but maybe with a few special challenges and, and paradigm shifts. Um, so, for example, we use Unity at a resolution, and for Wonderglade, we used a special version of Unity specifically made for the Daydream uh, development, which was like a fork of the engine co-developed by Google together with Unity, but otherwise it's normal Unity. Um, and, you know, we still, have, we still have concept artists, we still have uh, normal 3D models, we still need programmers, we, uh, we need audio, we need animations, all the regular stuff. And of course, there's some, some tight limitations on, on, for example, poly count and draw calls and texture sizes and being smart about your render budget. And optimization is a, is a very important step. Uh, and we have to do our testing for longer periods of time and not just for a few minutes. So this is because the thermal limits of the phone, where uh, if it gets too warm, it'll throttle down on performance, which you won't notice right away. So, and that in turn then could lead to a few drop frames or, or otherwise a bad experience. So, and hopefully not exploding either, that would be <laughs> bad. Hasn't happened yet as far as I know. Um, so there's some more quirky challenges, um, both design and implementation. Uh, when it comes to, for example, UI, uh, like for example, in Counter-Strike type games, you have like a health bar at the bottom and then an ammo counter somewhere. Uh, and, and that doesn't really translate to VR because if you attach something like that to the head of the player in VR, it becomes very natural and sort of uncomfortable. You, you have a piece of not intuitively understanding thing floating around you and, and attached to your head, then you can't really move your head to look at it because it moves away. And, it, there's, and you know, there's no real life equivalent of that. So sometimes your natural idea of, a, of a implementation is very unintuitive. So Unity has a lot of good design tips around VR Unity uh, and, and UI, and, and some of which we use and, and some of which we choose not to use. Um, and you know, generally, the, the best thing we know right now is having a, a world space UI living in the world at a given position or, or sort of in relation to the player. Um, and there are a few nice tricks. For example, the, the bottom there is a very dark image, wow, on, on a game called Dread Halls, which is, um, there's, a, there's a map, it's like a, you walk around in a dungeon and you look down and the map slides out in front of you. So it's, it's triggered when looking down and it's, it comes out from your stomach and it sounds really weird, but it's probably the smartest solution I've found so far for like a traditional UI in a VR game where you have n almost no inputs. Um, so there's some few tricks here and there you want to be careful with. Um, so in, in Bait, we did a, a sort of augmented reality 2D UI interface projected in front of the player, partly to save time on like R&D uh, and to reuse a lot of like design paradigms that we all know from regular UI. Um, so, you know, for example, if we've got like red X's in the corner that we use to close windows and you've got like a check mark to mark that you're done with a page and we've got buttons and tab-like navigation, like the things that we recognize from web or, or you know, 2D programs, stuff like that. But something that works very well in VR, uh, but takes a, maybe a bit more time to make you feel really natural is using real life objects 
uh, that we can relate to from the physical world. You know, maybe having a book with information that you use as you would use a book, uh, reading. Uh, yeah, um, so look at Job Simulator, where basically every, both UI and game interaction is a physical object that you interact with, basically how you would in the real world. You, you put a tape in the tape recorder and that starts a level. And there's, a, there's a, like a kitchen level and you, you have a kitchen door and, and you, you have to physically drag the door open, but you can imagine that they could have cheated and just had, if the user clicks the door, it would open for them. But, they chose to have that interaction physically based along with the rest of their game, which was a very conscious decision. Uh, I think that was smart. But maybe you wouldn't do that if you didn't think about it. You'd just do what we've done so far normally. So for example then, and in relation to mobile VR, there's a challenge compared to say PC or PlayStation or whatever, is that the interaction is quite limited. So the, the daydream controller is a move forward here with like a, you've got like a laser pointer type interaction scheme, which you could use as a mouse type input. Um, and you've got like orientation and rotation on that uh, and a few buttons. I guess you could describe it as a Wii type controller uh, with similar abilities. And we had to do a lot of exploration when it came to designing Wonderglade in trying to figure out how to use a controller as best as possible and as intuitively as possible for the things that we wanted to do. So another aspect is that activity could potentially happen 360 degrees around the user, but that's at least for mobile VR, not a very common use case scenario. Um, at resolution, we believe that the action for the player should be in front of the player and as little as possible behind the player. And it, it sounds like a fun idea to have interaction points behind the player, but it immediately, immediately becomes a product you can't play without standing up uh, with the risk of falling over or a swivel chair, which can be very discomfortable if, if you're moving around and you can't really sort of get a sense of the real world around you. So Bait and Wonderglade are specifically designed to be played when sitting still and not having to move around or look around more than what is comfortable for the neck. So all the action is sort of centered forward from you. And that's deliberate because it is a VR title rather than in spite of, which again could be one of those things that you at first thought said, hey, it's fun, let's put things, enemies coming from behind the player, but that, you know, and, and, and that's also the thing. For example, if we found that if you have action 360 degrees around the player, uh, it can, can become very stressful for the player. Uh, and, it, and you run a much larger risk of users uh, missing events in your game or things that they should interact with. Uh, and if you thought it was hard designing a, a website or you know, directing the attention of users on a, on a regular 2D interface, imagine having your canvas like several magnitudes larger and it's outside of the field of view and you have to you know, be very careful with that. So conservative use of attention driving events like visual and audibles, maybe particle effects or, you know, lights can be very effective, but it's tricky and it has to be done right with a lot of user testing and, and a lot of iteration to get it right. And just because that it works for you doesn't mean that everybody will see it. Uh, so that's where, for example, telemetry is very important. You have to really do analytics on this to sort of see it, are we hitting 90% or 100% or 20 of the user's understanding that they should interact with this button or what it might be? Um, so we found that the field of view of the player is quite narrow, especially when we want to focus on interactivity in front of the player. So I could describe it as basically a large TV in front of the player uh, with the center about eye height and a few meters on distance. And if it's too close, it just gets overwhelming and you, you don't know where to go. It's, again, like it's always a balance. There's always a, a, a scale here. So since most mobile platforms can't detect user body movement, so standing still or sitting down is, is almost in all cases a must. And then you compare this to the HTC, HTC Vive where you're supposed to move around. So this, this should change the design decisions you make, of course, like you know this, design for the platform, all that stuff. But you have to be very, you always have to think an extra turn because the things that we've learned from our years of playing might not actually apply. Um, so that's another thing, as I mentioned uh, quickly before, we have to, we can never ever drop below 60 FPS. Uh, so for example, that's a hard requirement for publishing daydream apps. Uh, we've seen that dropping just a few frames 
players can feel very uncomfortable. Um, the physical head movement of the player must always be a one-to-one -one match of the movement, movement of the camera in the digital world, uh, which could become out of sync if you drop frames or, or something like that. And again, thermals come in here. Um, and what happens then is that your eyes and your sense of balance would be saying different things, which is an excellent shortcut towards throwing up. Um, so on that note, on a shortcut of throwing up, camera movement is in VR is very hard as well. So basically, the, so far the consensus between VR developers that actively try to make accessible games seems to be to never move the camera when the player sees through the eyes of that camera. So you can use a teleport, you can fade to black or something like that to hide the movement. And if you look back like early on the lifespan of VR, for example, the Oculus DK1, um, there were a lot of roller coaster games that came out. And they were cool because people hadn't tried VR, it was a new experience, uh, but just about everybody felt a bit sick at some point. And it's generally not a good idea to have your players vomit after you play your game. <laughs> like that's, you know. So, um, for example, Starbreeze and Star VR are doing a Walking Dead VR experience game. Uh, and on some gameplay videos, you can see that the player avatar is, I think, like sitting in a wheelchair. Um, and I'm looking forward to trying that and seeing if it works and if it feels natural. And if it does work, it's probably a, a very good trick for movement in VR. Um, it's, it's, it's generally a good idea to give the player a solid point of reference uh, when it comes to camera movement. So if you have to move the camera, put the player in a vehicle that moves instead, uh, a car, a horse, um, um, a wheelchair, uh, you know, a, a car dashboard or another type of entity that takes up a large percentage of your field of view, but static in relation to the player, not the player's head. <laughs> uh, could help sometimes. Um, and there's another trick uh, used by Doom VR which uh, I haven't had the opportunity to test yet, where the player chooses a point in the world with like a ray casting type um, teleport gun. And so you point at a, at a place and then when you let go of the button, instead of teleporting, the character moves very quickly towards that point. Uh, but they also fade out or sort of blur out your peripheral vision. So you're, you're basically only seeing a 2D image like a regular screen in the direction you're moving. And then when you arrive there, you get back your peripheral vision, which could work really well. I don't know, I haven't tried it yet, but it sounds cool. So again, like your first ideas of how to solve a problem might not be good, or it might be very good. You, it's, it's hard, and that's the thing. <laughs> Examples like these are pretty good descriptions of the process of making VR games today. Like a large time, a large portion of the time spent in making VR games is in the explorative design space. Your assumptions and gut feelings might be completely wrong, or something that worked for another product, even the ones you made, might not apply at all here. Uh, so we definitely spend a lot of our time prototyping and trying new ideas, and, and which is a lot of fun. Uh, I know I've had my share of bad ideas, uh, but you only know that they are so truly bad if you try them, uh, which can be very fun. And if I'm a bit rude, like for example, I can think of fairly few elements in the normal game interaction design space that benefit from doing like massive innovation for let's say UI, unless you come up with something that's, that's really clever, that like makes it worth the investment of reinventing the wheel. Um, in VR, those investments in time and effectively money are still very viable to do since there are very many unknowns still. Um, it's not only because there are still things left to explore, sometimes there's no precedence uh, at all and you might have to come up with a new solution. And you might be the first on idea or there might be no information out there even though you know that somebody uh, tried it before you. Um, and every now and then something really smart comes along uh, and it's hard but we, we want to try and see if we can be in the forefront if we can. So far we seem to be doing okay. Um, so something that we notice is that characters, and especially faces, become very important in VR. Um, facial expressions, movement patterns, body language, uh, and speaking become much more present to the player. Uh, 
It's always been important, but it, 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 I'd say that it has another layer of, of sort of importance here. And it's also another challenge for mobile VR because you have to be very conscious about where you spend your render budget and your, your quality. And it's probably not feasible to do like real time blend shapes on a mobile GPU, for example, or other tricks and you know, a lot of shaders that you want to use, but you maybe not be able to. Um, so in a way, it's, it's harder to cheat in compared to regular 2D or 3D games. And in another way, it's a lot easier as well. So scales of objects in the world are very important. And the, the human mind is quite quick on, and accurate on picking up the subtle details about your surroundings. And if something's wrong, uh, it feels off. But on the other hand, in, in both Bait and Wonderglade, the camera position was fixed per scene. So we could optimize, optimize way a lot of the meshes and cheat with textures and fake transparency. And you, we could get away with a pretty good looking game for the platform. So this is running on, on uh, down to Galaxy S5s, I think, uh, and holding consistently 60 FPS in a 360 degrees view around you. Um, with real-time reflections of the water. And you know you can cheat a lot, but it, you have to be very conscious about it. So when it comes to playing and players, we can absolutely see spikes in downloads and usage patterns around evenings, especially weekends. Um, this, to me, points that we are competing against stuff like Netflix and PlayStation and Xbox and PCs rather than other mobile games when it comes to uh, competing for the attention of the consumer. So I even though it's running on a mobile phone, it's not used the same way or times as mobile games. Um, VR is not a toilet break activity. Uh, it's instead something we do, and we refer to it as appointment gaming, where the player has decided to take out your headset, uh, put it on, and start up at least one app. And hopefully, that's your app. Uh, and for example, we've seen that Bait has an average game time of around 15 minutes. Uh, and I personally don't know how that compares to other products and platforms. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily mobile games, per se. Um, and if I look at the market in general, without going into any you know, ultra specifics, I think one thing that I think is missing is, is not good games, but retention driving games. So, I like to compare it to Facebook early days, where a lot of people used it now and then. Uh, let's say once or tops a few times per week. And then Farmville comes along, and suddenly a lot of people go to Facebook daily, but not necessarily because of Facebook, but because of Farmville. Uh, and I'm not saying Farmville made Facebook, but I personally think there was a, a large group of people that started using Facebook in a daily matter instead of now and then. And, and Facebook, of, of Facebook, of course, helped out a lot, uh, building proper support for notifications and reaching users when their carrots were ready or whatever it was. And so in comparison, right now in VR, I'm sure there's a consumer group, let's say 23 to 25 year olds, that w with a strong interest for sci-fi. And they probably have a very high retention rate for that group or product when it comes to VR. Uh, but that's not going to be what brings in our our parents or people that don't already identify themselves as gamers uh, and are willing to buy a VR headset. So right now, it's, it's a bit unknown about the retention numbers of VR or mobile VR in general. The data that is out there is either a bit vague or, or most usually it's not even shared outside of the company that owns the data in the first place. So for example, HTC Vive came out with few sales figures uh, regarding the, the HTC came out with f figures regarding the Vive. And there are a few open databases about player metrics and sales from Steam that gives hint towards the market. Um, the other platforms doesn't really have download numbers visible to the public, uh, with the exception of Google Play, which combines the numbers into ranges of uh, you know 10,000 plus or 50,000 plus. But that's about it. Like, and sure, the Daydream platform is about a month old now too, so it's very early. Uh, so that was quick, but that was what I was planning on saying about VR today. Uh, we've hit the midpoint of my talk where I switch theme and topic quite drastically. Um, before that, are there any sort of burning questions that you have to get off your chest before I move on? And you can, of course, ask me later. I'm, you know, over a beer or something. Um, yeah? Um, I mean, it's a mic or... Repeat, you can repeat the question. Yeah. 
Uh, you spoke about uh, the connection between farm mill and Facebook. Mm. Uh, do you think that what's missing from getting more attention type games uh, with VR and things like that uh, is something where you don't actually have to remove the uh, VR device to communicate with other players? Uh, for instance, like uh, being presented in uh, MMO-like world where you're meeting other players and you're able to chat with them or talk to them. Right. That's going to be a hard question to repeat. Uh, but uh, you're asking if I think Farmville type games are. No, sorry, could you repeat? Uh, where, like, uh, Farmville doesn't stop you from communicating with other people or socializing, um, it actually helps you. Right. So, would. What I'm guessing I'm trying to say is would a game where you can directly communicate with other players? multiplayer like uh, while you're doing your other game activities to be able to retain players uh, in the way you're... Okay, so would uh, another game uh, where you're able to communicate with other players while playing other games? No, why? Uh, sorry. Sorry, so you're playing this game <laughs> in a multiplayer, multiplayer way. Yes. Because I guess uh, the games you presented so far are mostly single player focused. Uh, yes, partly true. Yeah. Would it be possible to have a MMO-like world mm. where you interact with other people, chat with them, whilst still doing the uh, core game mechanics? Right, okay, so uh, I'm going to answer communication in multiplayer VR instead. Um, so uh, it's definitely a challenge. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you're sometimes a bit limited by inputs, actually. So the Gear VR has one touch button and you can swipe on that. So you get four directions and a button and that's it. Um, so of course you can do voice communication, uh, but then we have all the issues of abuse and playing any online game uh, and knowing how that can be bad. So there's definitely some challenges here. Um, Context-based communication, predefined phrases might be a good way forward, but the full MMO experience uh, is starting to come, for example, there's the Rec Room for, for the Vibe, which is a game about hanging out and playing sports, uh, but it's mostly just hanging out, and you play a laser game, and, and, or paintball, and you shoot hoops, and, but it's actually just like a college dorm gym type thing. So I think right now we're limited by hardware and input to be able to do that type of communication right now. I think I'll move on. So um, this, this second half is about some observations I've made about the industry as I've seen and experienced it so far, what I've learned from it, and what I've learned about myself in relation to my work. Uh, and this is, if it wasn't clear before, this is where the opinion piece really starts. Uh, these are my personal observations, and don't take them as truths, but take them as you will. So I'm going to go back in time a bit. Uh, so during my sac si last six months of studies here at GAME, uh, which would be spring 2012, uh, I got the opportunity to go on basically like a scholarship type half year program and I ended up in Denmark, um, where, I got, where I stayed for two years. Uh, and there I studied and later got hired at the National Film School of Denmark on a program called Uchroma, where we did animated films and games together in a shared pipeline with shared assets and, and world building and story world and everything. Uh, and there I got in contact with a lot of people uh, around that area, especially Malmö Copenhagen. Um, and there's a, there's a very active indie scene and almost like alternative game dev um, there with, with traditional methods and ideas and um, you know a lot, of, a lot of game jams, a lot of meetups. And some of it I find really interesting and some of it is in my personal cup of tea. And without a doubt there are creative people everywhere and lots of talent to go around and it's not just here in, in Visby, there are other places as well. So. Um, there was a game made by a friend of mine called ARG, uh, and it was for four to four hundred people with a microphone as the only input. Uh, it's a horse racing game where you get assigned to a team via color, and, when, and the louder you are when your color is lit up on your screen, the faster your horse moves. Uh, and, uh, oh, sorry, I want to go back. Uh, so, 
um, it turns into this sort of wonderful choir of screaming and, and shouting, but it's completely unsellable, and you would kicked out. You, you you would get kicked out from anywhere if you even wanted to try it. But it, there's something there. It's it's crazy. It's really dumb, but it's kind of fun, right? The the girl on the left, Karin, I think is a speaker tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's some weird people out there. <laughs> One, no, sorry, not specifically Karin, maybe, but uh, you know, uh, well, maybe a bit. But yeah. so uh, one of the things I heard about in around there was uh, an unconference in Copenhagen called Burning Bridges, and where the part of the focus there was sort of questioning industry standards and criticizing practices that the attendees didn't like. Um, it was also very unspecific and mostly just a reason to hang out in around a barbecue and drink to a bar in Copenhagen, summertime, surprise, surprise. Um, but so the rest of my talk here today is what I'm guessing or hoping that they talked about at that meetup. Uh, when Marcus asked me to come here, I, one of the things I wanted to focus on was what I wish I knew earlier uh, in relation to work. So that means this is what I've gone through, you know, all the things I've already said. Um, it might get a bit personal. Uh, so you know. So I'm guessing most people in here are here because we care about games as a medium in some way or another, like either as entertainment or education or, or both. Uh, raise of hands, how many care about games at all? <laughs> right, exactly. We're here because this is what we want to do for now. And sometimes it feels like we'll want to do it for the rest of our lives. And personally, sometimes all I can think of is how lucky I am to be working with what is also my passion. And other times, I wish I could work with something less emotionally and motivationally intertwined with my private life. And so when I was studying, one of the coolest workplaces that I could imagine was the places that announced what you get when you were working there. Uh, a cool gaming rag rig for your spare time, if you had any, uh, a new phone, uh, free soda at the office, stuff like that. Uh, I thought that was luxurious. I got more and more motivated to, to work in this field with all the interesting things and, and you know tech you get to play with. And doesn't that sound like a good workplace? Like, wouldn't you want to work somewhere like that? You know, maybe. So here's something I realized, maybe a bit too late. All those nice perks, all those nice things you can get are never the, they're never instead of uh, a working environment without lots of overtime or, or lots of crunch or extreme stress or sort of unreasonable delivery deadlines and all those things. The perks can be extremely appreciated benefits or bonuses for a workplace that is already sound and healthy, but they cannot replace it. They are never instead of a good workplace. So I'm in this industry because of all the interesting problem solving, all the smart colleagues, all the multifaceted context that we move within. Uh, on top of finding it fun and super stimulating, and it's my passion, I spend most of my time surrounded by games in one form or the other. I play games on my spare time, I analyze parts of experience with society in game-like terms. Um, you know, probably you do too in, in a lot of ways. Uh, see games in everyday things. So there's a balance to be found here. I believe there's a balance to be found here. But I also believe that such a balance is different for each and every one of us. Uh, I have definitely failed finding that sweet spot before. Uh, I'm not sure I found it yet, but I'm, I think I'm closer now compared to before. Um, and I live for games, but that shouldn't mean that I live for my work. And I think there's an important distinction there. Working with games for me is definitely motivated by my passion for games, but that doesn't mean that my workplace should be allowed to burn my candle in both ends because of it being my passion. Um, I'm here because I want to be, but I still want and need, you know, like a somewhat sensible salary and like sleep at night and time to cook dinner and do laundry and you know normal life stuff that normal people do. Um, so full disclosure, I'm super happy with Resolution Games. It's by far the best workplace I've had yet and we have a lot of those perks. We've, we've got you know gym discounts and, and we can play VR whenever we want. We've got an extra week of paid vacation. Um, we can bring home stuff if we want to play it at home, but we're also encouraged to do research and play VR games on working hours. Um, 
and you know a few of us work part time. Um, they know that working effectively for one workday is better than working ineffectively for two in the same time or in the same day. Uh, so I'm glad that we get to see. No, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> so, so you know, all of these things are not sort of instead of a good working environment. It's it's complementary to it, right? It's it absolutely furthers it being a nice workplace, but it's not the reason. So, for me, friendly colleagues, good open communication between employers and employees, uh, uh, constructive as a default stressless environment, trust from your colleagues that you're doing the best you can and that you want the best for all of the team, and like an insensible planning of what you're going to do over the foreseeable future at least. And what you want from your workplace to feel safe and appreciated is probably very different than what I want. I'm just saying what I prefer right now, and it might change too. Uh, it, it has over these years. So some of these things are, are sort of super essential to me for having a good and constructive and creative workplace. And without them, I might not be very good at my job. Uh, I, I, if I had to spend most of my attention managing you know, constant day-to-day -day stress and problems that could be avoided by the company or myself with, for example, better planning, if I didn't have a, a good producer, uh, all of those things takes away from what I want to do. I want to make games. So good on you, Annika. <laughs> um, so if you solve all those things, right, you should be happy. Like, Surely, right? Well, mm. um, that doesn't mean that you're automatically not stressed when working somewhere where it's nice. There's also you in this mix. So for example, how many people know what imposter syndrome is? So good. Psychological re research done in early 1980s estimated that two out of five successful people considered themselves frauds. And other studies have found that 70% of all people feel like imposters at one time or another. So these are a few people that are open about themselves sometimes feeling like fra frauds or being afraid of people finding out that they would be. Um, do you recognize any of them? Well, m maybe this one, <laughs> but what about the rest? Raise your hands. It's not super important, but yeah, you in the pink shirt. <laughs> not, okay, fair enough. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Good. No, no, exactly. So uh, I've I've got the cheat notes here. So I'll I'll do it. Uh, it's we've got writer John Green uh, in the middle. We've got comedian Tommy Cooper, who uh, very famous. Facebook chief operating officer uh, Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, actress Emma Watson. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Sorry, Sheryl Sandberg was her name, uh, the Facebook CEO. These are pretty important people, right? These are, are successful people. Uh, according to Wikipedia, imposter syndrome is when high-achieving individuals marked by an inability to internalize their accomplishments and a persistent fear of being exposed as a fraud, in quotation marks. The syndrome has affected, affected approximately 70% of the population worldwide, however, often goes unrecognized. If it's not addressed, victims can develop anxiety, stress, low self-confidence, depression, shame, and self-doubt. And imposter syndrome can limit exploration and the courage to delve into new experiences in fear of exposing failure. That's not something we want as creative people. Uh, those are hard words, right? The so far best way to work with this is to discuss it with other people, especially early in the career path. So if you've ever felt that you're out of your depth, if you're doubting yourself, so as probably most others around you too felt at some point, and not just celebrities, of course. I had no idea this was a thing. I thought I was all alone in this, and I learned this way too late. How many of you heard the saying, fake it till you make it? I, I think that saying sucks. <laughs> it, it deliberately confirms and validates the idea that you are a fake, but presents it that, like that's okay and that you can still achieve success, whatever that means for you, if it's, I don't know, money or fame or love or appreciation or something. I think that's terrible. Like, you're not, you're not fake. After years, I've finally managed to see myself as not fake, but flawed and imperfect and still learning. 
And my first job was teaching game dev to people who sometimes had master's degrees in interactive media, whereas I hadn't even finished my bachelor. And most of them were older than me at the time. Well, they still are, probably. <laughs> um, and you know, I deliberately wore like a nice shirt uh, every day, and I dressed very proper compared to what I would, would what I would want to wear, maybe. Uh, and I did this in an attempt to give myself confidence and, and sort of authority, and not to let it show that I was a fake. And, and it was a constant struggle every morning to go to work. And <laughs> nowadays, I am super proud of what I managed to do then but the emotional cost was maybe a bit too high. I still have lots to learn today, both as spare time and like a professional person, but I'm proud of what I know and what I can do today. But I still want to learn more. So nowadays when I actively think, you know, I know all these things and I'm looking forward to learning these things instead of, oh man, I don't know all these things. Uh, that's helped me a lot. It doesn't actually change how much I know at this time, but it does change how willing and able I am to learn new things. Talk to each other about this. Like, talk to each other about self-confidence. If you can and the situation and relationship allows. Like, I don't know if that means your significant other or your, your mother or your father or your friends or like a cab driver. Like, hear me when I say that you're probably not alone in experiencing feelings of inadequacy or self-doubt. And if it's too much, you should talk to somebody. We could lose a competent and creative talent to the industry otherwise. And I don't want that and you don't want that and neither for yourself or for your colleagues. And at least personally, I want to work with people that are smarter than me to learn from them. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in a few years working together, so don't stop before you get started. I, I was very close. Uh, so the next thing I learned at my first job was that I wasn't doing at all what I thought I'd be doing. I, I wasn't programming all day and all night. I was doing lots of other things at day and sometimes at night. Uh, and I was still developing games, but a very small portion of my time was spent there. I, I was a teacher and like a first point of contact for up to 60 students. Um, I also helped manage, uh, or I, I self-managed a version control server for 60 people, uh, the same 60. I taught them how to use it. Uh, we, in the end, we transferred 35 terabytes of data per month. We set up backup routines, with fixing redundancy, and you know, lots of interesting challenges. I was helping out booking flight tickets for guest lectures. I, I helped booking their hotels. I had inventory of all the keys to the building. I kept track of who borrowed what from the tech locker. I did lots of things I still, I didn't know how to do. And I, that's still the case. I, you know, you learn on the job, kind of. But today at my fourth like proper games job, some of what I did at my first workplace is what I profile myself as when it comes to new jobs. So my official title at Resolution Games is actually non-game game developer. Uh, I still make games during my, my working hours. It's supposed to be something like 50-50, where I make 50% uh, games and 50% like pipeline and tooling. But um, usually it's a bit more towards making games because I want to make games uh, because it's fun. And sometimes we need more tools and varies a lot. And I enjoy the tooling bit as well. So today, I manage you know, build systems and version control systems. I build tools and utilities for the rest of the team. I automate boring, uh, time-consuming tasks for artists, uh, light mapping, stuff like that. Whatever the needs are at the time uh, to make the production go as smoothly as possible from like a, a tooling and a technical point of view. So my point is, whatever your first or fifth job is, it's probably going to change what you consider your job is. Don't be afraid to take on new responsibilities and especially get good at seeing the value in doing things that you at first sight might not consider useful to you right now. So there's, there's always something, there's always value in what you do. It's just sometimes very hard to identify that value. Uh, I'm not saying however you spend your time is a good way to spend your time. I'm saying whatever you do, it's not worthless. And of course, on the other hand, don't stretch yourself too far either. You, you can't do everything, but I'm guessing you can do more than you think you can do. And if you don't know it, you'll probably learn it soon. Hopefully. <laughs> so looking back, like most of my time at game was spent trying to better myself at the craft of making games. All courses were 
Aimed at that, of course, like what else would a program dedicated to making game developers do? So at my first job, I felt like I got a right hook reality check to the face. Like nothing was as clear cut as I thought. The stuff that I felt I knew the complexities of sometimes seemed much easier in the real world. And, and, and one of the things that I really liked about game was that it was very practical. We, we learned how to make games by making games. So it was, it was presented and taught as a craftsmanship here. And the time you spend studying here is where you try and probably fail in making good games. And this is the time to try your ideas, because out there, the cost of failing could be potentially higher. And I'm, I'm mostly saying it's way better to fail here than out there. And you're going to fail sometime, so better do it now. Um, you've probably heard it lots of times. You know, fail fast, fail early, um, test often. I think that sounds smart. Um, when studying, I tried to write excellent code. I failed just about every time. Uh, I tried to make the best game design I could whenever, probably failed there too. I, I know I failed there too. Um, I think, I mean, I did okay stuff looking back, but I was, I, I don't think, I don't, maybe I didn't do anything truly terrible, but I was never happy. I, I, I'm still looking to get better, but I've, I've kind of learned that good enough is good enough as well. Like, and that I shouldn't punch myself when I don't deliver above and beyond. I'm not, I'm not worried about my motivation. This is what I want to do with my life for now. I'll do all that I can, but there are deadlines and deliverables, and, and there's a budget and a certain amount of resources available for production, and sometimes you're just undercut, undercut uh, by too few hands on deck, and sometimes the deadline is so strict that uh, you have to cheat at every corner to get anything to market. And, and that's not, I wouldn't consider that a failure, it's, it's reality in a way, and it's, it's more important to get something out there than to never get a potential product, perfect product out. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously not saying throw out whatever crap you can cobble together either, but make it as good as you can with the resources you have, and don't consider it a personal failure. If, if you really want to, you can consider it a professional failure maybe, or, or blame your producer. <laughs> so, I have this idea, and it's super unscientific, but I'd like to extend the saying fail fast and to propose to make bad games, like deliberately. Maybe in your spare time, uh, or at least not on anybody else's money. Maybe during a school assignment, but only if Marcus tells you to. Uh, don't fail an assignment deliberately because you heard me say it. <laughs> uh, you know. My thinking here is inspired from writers and journalist uh, educations, where they tell you to write bad stories with all the cliches you can think of and all the shitty tropes and then they sit in a group and first you describe and basically destroy your own work in your own words bringing up all the bad tropes and 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 what you use to make it deliberately bad and then you let others describe and destroy it with their words and i'm saying like make it classy bad like the equivalent of a terrible erotic novel where nothing is a turn on for anybody and and or like a story where the character wakes up and it was all just a dream or you know like the the, the game equivalence of that is what i'm saying uh, what that means is what that means is probably up to each and every one of you uh, but i think you know what i mean for example i've had this deliberately bad like knowingly bad idea of a vr game where you are a horse but you could see the world like the horse. So you would have your eyes facing outward uh, <laughs> rather than forward. And I know this, like, this is a bad idea. This is a terrible idea. And I still want to make it. I want to understand what happens to my brain. How, quick, how quickly can I adjust? How quickly can I induce headache? Uh, like, I want to try the extremes on both ends of the spectrum um, and to try and learn more about like, my creative process and where I sometimes go wrong myself. This is especially true for like indie, where you have basically full control of your own products, and you make something, and you should try and make bad games as well. Like I, th I think there's something there. <laughs> and I think the point here to, is to acknowledge that sometimes we are just like really bad writers, writing really bad stories without knowing. And if we instead try to do our craft deliberately bad and do that well, whatever that means, and with dedication, I'm hoping it'll be easier to identify when we slip into using tropes and cliches by mistake instead, because you've already made them deliberately and you, you can identify them easier. It's, it's also like a good trick to see the range you have as a designer. 
if you do have a bit of low self-esteem every now and then, try to make the worst trash you can possibly imagine and realize how good your other stuff is compared to that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not saying I didn't make bad games when I studied. I had lots of really bad ideas. I, I still do, clearly. But sometimes I make them on my spare time. And I'm saying I wish I had deliber deliberately tried to make bad games earlier to get better at making good games. So some, you know, summary. Be vigilant about your first job. Be prepared that it might not be as rainbow as you thought. Or it might be really good, I don't know. I'm preparing you guys for the worst case. <laughs> Try not to worry about feeling out of depth. Talk to somebody. Uh, don't describe yourself as failed. Describe yourself as still learning. For yourself and others, for that matter. Be emotionally prepared that you might be doing something completely different. See the value in what you do, however little. If shit hits the fan, good enough is good enough. You did what you could and keep failing now. So I've covered a lot of things briefly. I hope there was some value here. Uh, if you're too afraid to ask now, uh, you can ask me later tonight. Uh, I'm easily bribable with beer. Um, thank you for listening. Any questions? <laughs> thank you, thank you. In the back there. Did you say that your VR games were free? Uh, so far, we have released three free VR games where two of them have cosmetic in-app purchases. Uh, was that, yeah, I'm guessing that wasn't the full yeah. question. Uh, so how do you deal with the, with the free aspect? Because I guess you can't do advertisement and normal stuff as in a normal game without making the player puke. Right. Like you said. Uh, well, I mean, you could, you could place it on banners somewhere. But uh, we don't have any ads. Um, so right now, it's optional extra content, the uh, hats. And, and uh, with a fishing game, you can buy an extra location. Um, we are a startup with a, we had a good investment round. So we are looking to get ahead of the curve. And we're not actually focusing on making games right now. But we will have to, of course. Maybe somebody there? I don't know. Hi, uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask about your target audience uh, because you have this really, uh, this company dedicated specifically to VR and uh, from what I've seen specifically, uh, mobile VR, right? Mm. Uh, so who, who is the person who buys these things? Are they like tech people or are they like casual people who gets into VR and like, what's your profile? Who, who, who plays it? Right. Your audience. I'm really interested in that. So, well, first off, VR headsets is the Christmas present of the year in Sweden and maybe more places. Uh, so we are basically pre-market. Uh, there are people out there, like, um, as I said, three months ago, Samsung said there's a million and a half headsets. That's not a massive market. That's still pretty early on. Um, but... The people that play our games are, oh, that's so hard. Uh, so Wonderglade, the last title, is not necessarily a kid's game. Like, there's an age limit, and there probably maybe should be an age limit of where, you know. Uh, but it's, it, we're, we're, we're hitting a broad market. I really can't, I can't really speak for the target audience. Okay. Uh, sorry. That's OK. It's, it, it is a good question. It's tricky. I, I should, um, yeah. yeah, find me later. I feel like VR is like really high tech but also there's like this mobile for casual people that is less high tech and it's like super interesting to see what people do with it oh yeah. thank you yeah find me later yes and this time maybe your personal work that you translate into resolution games all right the microphone <laughs> <laughs> one more time does your personal work value that you presented here uh, uh translate to resolution games work environment so the things i feel strongly about Yes. Uh, yes, I think they do, and that's why I'm happy here. Uh, uh, that's not always been the case. It's, it's tricky, it's individual, it's up to every one of us to find what we want, what is important to us, uh, what we need to be happy with, with what we do. Uh, but yeah, I feel like I've found something now. Follow-up question, how did it, uh, was it deliberately, oh, <laughs> 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 was it deliberately, 
how did it end up the company? Uh, how did these values uh, uh, in the company end up being those values? So, a lot of key people at Resolution were key people at King. Uh, there's clearly some um, some connection there, where King has very early on been one of the sp spearheads of good working environments in game. Uh, it's also changed a lot since I since since we studied. It's it's gotten better better in general. Um, a lot of startups have an easier time of adjusting to these new things, whereas if you look back at larger companies, maybe there's a bigger push that has to happen to change that company culture, which is why I, I look for smaller companies to work for. Um, but uh, I think it's, yeah, there's a lot, it's, it's again, it's, it's, it's such a complicated working environment and, and values for the company is so important, but it's kind of hard for us, unless we start our own, to affect those values. Thank you. Great and intimate talk, I would say. <laughs> yes, I appreciate it very much. Um, I do have a question. I want to go back to uh, uh, mobile VR specifically mm -hmm. and uh, Google Daydream compared to other uh, mobile VR headsets. Uh, what are the pros and cons you would say who have worked with it? <laughs> right. So. Uh, jokingly, the first thing that comes to my head is that the Google Daydream VR headset looks like you have pants on your head, which could be very nice or maybe a bit awkward. It's a very comfortable headset, it's very light. If you've tried cardboard, it's nothing like that. <laughs> so that's a good description, right? Um, so Gear VR is also a very comfortable headset. It's maybe a bit heavier, it's a lot more plastic. Um, Daydream is also no electronics at all in the headset. So it's probably going to last for more generations of smartphones because you just switch out the smartphone and then you're good to go. Um, it's also, um, it, Google has deliberately tried to make it like a, a fashion accessory rather than a piece of tech, which is another thing on the pants on the head thing. Uh, but it's, I think they are really moving towards general adoption rather than tech nerdy people that are comfortable with having a chunk of plastic on their head. Cool. Yep. Uh, I don't have a question. I'd just like to say a really good presentation. Um, a lot of the, these things reflected with me and I remember, I think it was my uncle or something, he told me uh, when I graduated my master's, like, up until this point, you've only been learning and it doesn't really matter because it's when you start working, that's when you really, really begin learning. Mm. And that's like for everyone in this room, even us who are working in the industry, we're still learning and everyone's going to yes. be learning throughout their life. You don't have to be an expert when you graduate. You're not supposed to be. <laughs> You're going to just keep on learning forever. So yeah. Uh, don't absolutely, be scared. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Like. So uh, at one point there's, there was a slide of, of a dog uh, in a science costume and I have no idea what I'm doing. Like that is pretty spot on. That doesn't mean that I don't consider myself competent. It just, I am very aware that there are a lot more to learn. Uh, and I'm still proud of what I know now, but I still have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but that's okay. Anything else? Thank you so much. <laughs>